Welcome everyone to this webinar. We thank you for joining us um, for Turtle Island of Palestine, Understanding Settler Colonialism. My name is Alicia Rinkowska and I'm the Development Coordinator at Christian Peacemaker Teams. So for those of you who don't know us, Christian Peacemaker Teams or CPT is an organization that trains everyday people to work in local peacemaking communities that are confronting situations of lethal conflict partnering with them to transform violence and oppression. Just would like to do a little housekeeping before we get started. So Rochelle's presentation will take approximately 45 minutes and after which we will have space for questions and answers. So if you do have any questions, I'd like you to use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen and please type your question there. Now I'd just like to introduce our presenter, Rochelle Fusion. Uh, Rochelle is CPT's Canada coordinator and is based in Toronto. Uh, she's previously worked in Bethlehem, Palestine for five years doing peace and human rights work and has a company work in Iraqi Kurdistan, US-Mexico borderlands and Turtle Island. Rochelle studied the similarities of settler colonialism between Canada and Israel at York University. Once again, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box and we'll get through as many as we can. Now I turn it over to you, Rochelle. Hello, thank you, friends. Um, I just want to say I'm really excited for this opportunity uh, to share with you today. I'm going to start sharing my screen immediately. One moment. And I also just want to acknowledge that I'm doing this presentation today um, from Toronto, which is the Dish With One Spoon territory, the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Mississauga of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, and the Wendat. And I also want to acknowledge that the land that I'm currently on is land that has never been uh, ceded or relinquished by the nations um, of this land. So I'm a guest on this land or potentially an invader on this land. I do identify as a settler. And as we talk about settler colonialism, one thing I also want to mention is that due to the violence of settler colonialism, myself and my ancestors have benefited a lot from this violence. I have not experienced the structure and some of the things we'll be talking about uh, firsthand. Rather, these are learnings that I have received uh, from CPT partners, both from Turtle Island and from Palestine. <clears throat> and so today we are going to be talking about understanding settler colonialism. And I think this is a really important topic for us to speak about um, if we want to undo settler colonialism. We first have to understand the structure and what makes up settler colonialism for us to know how to resist settler colonialism. And so today I'm going to be sharing with you some political theory. I'm going to be sharing with you some stories, some maps, and some pictures. So my hope is whatever your learning style and preference is, is that you'll be able to receive something out of this presentation. Um, and of course, we're gonna have technical difficulties. Uh, one moment here. Uh, Alicia, can you just confirm that you can see the slide, what is settler colonialism? Yes, we can see it, Rochelle. Okay, so I just want to point out, um, there are differences between settler colonialism and traditional forms of colonialism. That is not to say that one is more violent or one is better than the other, uh, but there are different ways um, these colonialisms express themselves. And so traditional colonialism, is the process where uh, folks from, let's say, the European Empire or Britain go abroad and they land somewhere, colonize it for the sake of resource extraction. And so they are taking silver, gold, uh, agriculture, labor, people, and they are taking it back to the motherland for the purpose of the motherland's economy and the empire itself. Where settler colonialism is different is that settlers are invaders and they are coming to stay. They are coming to stay and they are coming to impose their own system of culture and government, governance and economy onto this land that they are on. 
So rather it being an event situated in the past, it's an ongoing structure. And this is something that's important to remember, especially for myself, as I live in Canada or Northern Turtle Island, and Canadian society and the Canadian government likes to celebrate itself as being multicultural, as being supportive of human rights, of being anti-racist and working towards reconciliation. Except that this structure of settler colonialism has never been dismantled here. And this structure is something that is happening in Palestine as well. So key to settler colonialism is this constant need for the settler state to acquire land. They're constantly taking more and more land uh, for the purpose of settler expansion, capitalism, and industry. And in order to do so, Indigenous people must always be disappearing from this land. And so I'm going to be talking a bit about how this has been playing out in Palestine and in Turtle Island. But I also want to point out that this structure of settler colonialism has played itself out in Australia, in the United States, uh, in South Africa as well. There's one other thing that I need to acknowledge in this presentation is that this settler colonial structure I think is rooted in white supremacy. And so there are various ways the structure targets all people of color. Uh, we don't, I don't have enough time today to go into um, how that plays itself out as well. Potentially there could be a part two to this presentation at some point. Uh, but I want to acknowledge that, but I will be focusing on how this system and structure impacts Indigenous people uh, on Turtle Island and Palestinians. So these are the ways I, I will be <clears throat> talking about how, how Indigenous people are disappeared. Um, and it's through historical narratives of discovery, creating borders to control the land, to fragment the land and contain Indigenous people, and I also want to point out that sometimes when I say Indigenous people, um, I'm also referring to Palestinians because Palestinians are the Indigenous people uh, of Palestine. It's also done through really bureaucratic systems um, of governance. So bureaucratic systems of who gets citizenship, what does citizenship look like, given your identification from the government, how are you allowed to live and operate in space and land. I will be focusing briefly on the military occupation and imprisonment of Indigenous people, but I'm going to spend more time speaking on the other topics, just because the occupation and the imprisonment part is really important to look at, but it's a very overt way the system plays itself out, and I want to look at more of the subtle ways settler colonialism plays itself out. And I also want to spend time addressing what this, the settler mob uh, and how they work to create insecurity and vulnerability on Indigenous populations. So Indigenous people, through settler colonialism, their erasure begins uh, through historical narratives of discovery. As I'm sure many of you folks know, Turtle Island was colonized due to the doctrine of discovery. The doctrine of discovery was a papal, papal bull that went out in the 1500s that said that the European empire had a moral and legal right to claim lands where folks were not, not Christian. So because on Turtle Island, the indigenous people that were here were not Christians, they were considered heathen, and therefore they were considered not human. So the Christian, the empire was able to, decided it was morally acceptable and legal to colonize here. And because indigenous people were considered not human, it created this idea of terra nullius, that this land was empty for the sake of taking it over for settlers to come and make this wonderful land of milk and honey uh, profitable uh, through agricultural and other means. And it's something that we see with Zionism as well. So political Zionism began in the late 1800s and political Zionism used religious doctrine uh, in order to create their nation state. And this, they used religious doctrine that the Jewish people were given physical pieces of land uh, by God. So that God was somehow an arbiter and being able to hand out physical pieces of land 
uh, and they had given the land of Pal God had given the land of Palestine to the Jews. Prominent European Zionist uh, Israel Zangwill articulated the slogan that Palestine or Israel was a land without a people for a people without a land. And this was a very popular slogan and yet Palestinians were there. And so in this very slogan, we can see that Palestinians have been wiped out from the historical narrative. Their, <clears throat> their ancestry, their history, um, their cultural practices are not there. In, in the very birth of this narrative, Palestinians do not exist. And I wanna just point out that this discovery narrative is really key um, well, it's not as prominent in Israel and Palestine. It is very key to the Canadian ethos um, and fabric of our society. This is a old Ontario license plate whose mantra was Ontario is yours to discover. So furthering that the idea that Ontario has these empty places and that we myself as a settler, uh, as someone who's driving a vehicle, um, has the opportunity to discover these new lands on my own. Another way indigenous people are removed from the land is by creating borders, fracturing and controlling the land. So the slide on the left is a picture of Turtle Island and the traditional boundaries of the multiple nations that exist on Turtle Island. And I wanna point out that it's not just one nation that was here, oftentimes, the, the state will talk about indigenous people as if they are just one group. Uh, it was multiple nations that existed here prior to contact. And these were the traditional boundaries. Now these boundaries were not like the modern nation state boundaries. There was no custom control officers. These boundaries were often shifting, but I just wanna show what these natural, um, what these natural groupings sort of looked like. And then at contact through settler colonialism, we get the boundaries on the right. Canada, United States, Mexico, the lines are not drawn according to what previous nations uh, lived. The lines are drawn by the, the settler colonial states. And yet the lines keep being drawn throughout settler colonialism. And one of the ways in which the lines were being drawn was through the process of treaties. Now treaties were agreements that were negotiated uh, between indigenous nations and the Canadian state or the crown in reference to the queen. So these are the treaties that were created. <clears throat> um, and again, I want you to look, these boundaries here of the treaties do not follow the traditional boundaries of the slide on the left. So these treaties were done in part through negotiation, also done through coercion, and a lot of deception and violence took place. Now Canada's understanding of the treaties was that indigenous people were surrendering, surrendering their land. So the Canadian state had this idea that land was a commodity, it could be owned, uh, for personal benefit and controlled that way. And through treaties, indigenous people were surrendering and giving up their land. Now, many indigenous uh, understandings of the treaties was that one, land is not something that can be actually owned. It was a gift from the creator and that through the treaties, there would be a process of land sharing so that settlers and indigenous people would be able to live and exist on this land together in a nation to nation relationship. Now, part of the reason um, the indigenous people had this understanding was because the treaties were often written in English and then translated into indigenous language. Many things were left out in the, trans in the oral translation of what indigenous leaders were signing. Um, Many indigenous people thought the agreement said one thing and then signed and it turned out it said something entirely different. I also wanna point out that there were quite a few leaders that resisted signing these treaties. And I think about Chief Big Bear, uh, who's in tre from Treaty 6 in Saskatchewan, who refused to sign the treaties because he thought it would destroy, destroy uh, the culture of his people. However, the Canadian state, um, restricted his tribe 
And eventually Chief Big Bear was faced with the reality that his people were going to be starved to death by the Canadian state if he did not sign the treaty. And so many of the indigenous communities were forced under the threat of violence and under the threat of starvation into signing these agreements. And then through settler colonialism, indigenous people were removed from the land and placed into very small tracts of land called reserves. And so I just want to go back and forth for a second. Here again, you see on the left, all of Turtle Island, where indigenous people were living um, in community, traveling, and they were forced onto tracts of land where these little red dots are, reserves. For a while in Canadian history, um, it was not allowed to leave the reserve unless you had a pass from the Canadian state. And so you can see how Indigenous communities in Canada have been slowly pushed into these contained, isolated communities. In Canada, there are over 3,100 reserves across, across Canada. Uh, and I think in a time, this has always been a significant issue, but I think it becomes even more atrocious during this time as we're dealing with a global pandemic, that there is mass amounts of inadequate housing on a reservation, on reservations across Canada and poor sanitation. So many reserves across Canada do not have adequate access to clean, potable drinking water. And at a time when the opportunity for social distancing is important um, and the opportunity for sanitation is important, this becomes particularly scary. So today, the reserve system only represents 0.2% of Canada's total land mass. And the reason why Indigenous folks were pushed off their territory into these containable reserves was so that uh, settlers could come, build urban communities that were often far away from reserves, um, and that the settler colonial state could expand without having to keep in mind Indigenous populations. And this is something that we've seen through the history of Palestine as well. And so the, slide, the map on the left um, is a map of Palestine uh, 1947. Now I wanna point out that prior to 1947, uh, you can see that there's Palestinian land and Jewish communities. Uh, Jews and Palestinians uh, prior to the rise of political Zionism uh, did live in relative peace. Not to say that there weren't tensions but they did live together in relative peace. It was this notion of political Zionism that really started uh, to create the tensions. Now, after the horrors and the atrocities of the Holocaust, uh, the international community, and by the international community, uh, this is really the West, so Europe, North America, decided that Jews needed a land to feel safe and to create their own state so they proposed the partition plan, and that's what the second map looks like, is the partition plan. So even though Palestinians weren't responsible for the rise of anti-Semitism in Europe, uh, that, that caused the Holocaust, the Palestinians were not responsible for turning the boats uh, of Jews trying to flee Europe in the US, where the US turned away boats uh, of Jews trying to flee Europe. Palestinians weren't responsible for that either they were supposed to now make way for a new state on their land. Palestinians rejected this because why should the majority of the population have to give up the majority of the land? 1948, war breaks out. Then war breaks out again in 1967 and you get the third map there. And in, after 1967, Palestine becomes the West Bank and Gaza and they become under uh, Israeli military occupation. And this is where we see the process of settler colonialism more and more on this land until you get to present day, where you see in the West Bank there, these small islands of Palestinian controlled areas that are not connected um, and under, under the pseudo control of the Palestinian Authority. And what that looks like more closely in the West Bank is this. So this is the international, internationally recognized green line. Within that you have Israeli settlements, you have Israeli outposts. So these are places where Israeli settlers are moving into. You have the wall that goes in and around the West Bank, uh, confiscating more land and water as it goes. 
All of this creates settlement blocks, so blocks of settler territory well within inside the West Bank. You have the Eastern Segregation Zone, which is under Israeli military control, and uh, Palestinians face a lot of restrictions in that area. You have Israeli controlled roads. So in the West Bank, you actually have uh, roads in the, that are built on Palestinian land, uh, but Palestinians are not allowed to drive on these roads. And just to point out that even at the time of the, the, the height of apartheid in South Africa, um, there weren't ever segregated roads. And yet in the West Bank, there currently are a few roads that are segregated. And then you have Palestinian areas A and B, which is supposed to be areas where Palestinians have control. But again, you can see Palestinians have been pushed from the territory into these small controlled contained spaces and all around them is settler colonial, the settler colonial infrastructure of Israel. And so I want to just take a moment to talk about the walls that divide. So the picture on the top, my top left, um, is a picture of the wall from inside Ida refugee camp in Bethlehem. So this is one way the settler colonial state uh, divides and fractures land is by concrete walls. Now this wall is built right up alongside Ida refugee camp and I want to point out that the olive grove beyond that wall is actually um, an olive grove belonging to the people of Bethlehem. And yet when Israel built this wall, the folks who own those trees were now separated from their trees. And to be able to har harvest the olives, um, access the trees, they now needed a permit from the state to be allowed to access uh, those trees, creating a lot of restrictions in movement and being able to access land as well as economic destruction. So you have physical walls that create boundaries and restrict movement. But then I want to point out the slide on the top right, and this is a picture of Winnipeg. Now Winnipeg, when Winnipeg was developed, um, there was the the wealthy the wealthy capitalist class so the 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 business leaders of Winnipeg living on the south side of the tracks they made the decision to develop the north side of the tracks with the idea that that is where their workforce was going to live so at that time it was mainly eastern european settlers coming uh, and they were forced into this overcrowded area in the north end that by design in the city of Winnipeg was to be where a more exploited, undesirable class was going to live. Now, over time, that has changed and that has shifted. Um, and today in Winnipeg, the North End is where there's the highest uh, Indigenous population in Winnipeg. Between the North End and the South End of Winnipeg are these tracks, sometimes numbering 22 across. There are three ways to get uh, either over or around these tracks. You either, there's two overpasses and one underpass. Um, for a population where public transit isn't very well served into the north end, there isn't a lot of car ownership into the north end, what this divide does of the tracks is create its own boundary, its own wall through this whole system. And then you move to the picture in the bottom right, beneath that, we go back to Palestine and we see other forms of walls, similar to how that slide is of the West Bank where everything is being cut up. Here you have Palestinian children on the edge of their, on the edge of their village. And they're looking out over a settler road, a settlement, and over on the other side of that is another Palestinian village. That settler highway and that settlement does act as a barrier and in a way a wall in inhibiting the villi villages to access each other. These Palestinian kids know that in order to get to that other village, they're going to have to go on Palestinian controlled roads, various checkpoints, loop around the settlement, uh, potentially being stopped by the soldiers, being stopped by the police along the way. And this does, it creates its own boundary as well. And then when we move to the slide, the picture on the bottom left, this is when we talked about how reserves being placed into isolated areas in Canada. This is a picture of the community of Shoal Lake 40 near Winnipeg. Now for years, uh, the community of Shoal Lake 40 um, was on a man-made island in the middle of Lake Winnipeg. Um, 
And they relied, in order to get to the mainland, so to get to um, major grocery stores, to get medical care, uh, to get to the mainland, they relied on a barge to carry them across the lake or wait until the lake had frozen and they could drive across. The one issue with that is come November and come March, either the ice isn't thick enough yet to drive across, but there is ice so the barge can't go, or the ice uh, is now breaking, therefore effectively creating its own barrier and its own wall. Uh, thankfully, in this past year, um, a road was built called the Freedom Road that now connects Shoal Lake 40 to the mainland. But for generations, uh, this barrier has been something that exists. So I just want you folks to take a moment to yourself to think about what barriers do you see in your life um, that are keeping people in space uh, and away. Another part of the settler colonial process is who gets to define who, what, who is indigenous and who is not. And depending on what your identity is under this state does give you certain amount of rights or privileges or takes away uh, a certain amount of rights and privileges and can also control your movement. What access are you going to have in space? So in Canada, it was the Indian Act that defined who is indigenous. So an indigenous person couldn't say, well, I identify as being indigenous. No, that was something the settler state defined. At one point in time, that definition came from blood quantum um, and the definition was always changing. Uh, so at one time you could lose your indigenous status. If an indigenous woman were to marry a non-indigenous man, she would lose her indigenous status and neither her kids would also wouldn't have it. At one point in time in Canada, if an Indigenous person became a doctor, a lawyer, uh, joined the army, uh, became a professional, they could also lose their Indigenous status. Uh, and it was a way to assimilate, erase the Indigenous population into the settler population. There's a theorist out there called Scott Laura Morganson. Uh, he calls this a process of statistical genocide, this process of removing people's identity. And in Palestine, we see this bureaucratic system playing out too. So the I picture of the identification on the left, that is the Palestinian Hawiya. Uh, so if you are a Palestinian from the West Bank, you get a Hawiya. My friend Samer, that's not him, uh, but my friend Samer has a Hawiya. He lives in Al Khadr, which is a community next to Bethlehem. His green Hawiya means he's allowed to vote in the elections of the Palestinian Authority. It means he can travel on Palestinian roads in the West Bank, even though there's a settler road that goes right through his land, he's not allowed to drive on that one um, because of his green ID. He's allowed to move around the West Bank on certain roads, not on other roads. He cannot enter Jerusalem, East Jerusalem or West Jerusalem. He cannot, without a permit from Israel, he cannot enter Gaza without a permit and he cannot enter the 48 or Israel without a permit as well. So given his identity, um, it depends where, what space he can access. Um, it also means that the laws that he ascribes to are both the Palestinian Authority laws as well as the Israeli military laws. Um, and we'll talk a bit more about that later. The next picture is a picture of Palestinian Jerusalem ID. And this is a really interesting bureaucratic system um, in that Palestinians from Jerusalem are not citizens of the Palestinian Authority and they're not citizens of Israel. Rather, Palestinians from East Jerusalem are allowed to reside in the city as permanent residents. That is very similar to how when new immigrants come to Canada, they don't become citizens right away. They become permanent residents first. However, folks, Palestinians from Jerusalem are perpetually given this permanent residency status. So for example, my friend Daoud, who's from East Jerusalem, he can track his family from on paper from being from Jerusalem for the last 400 years. And that's just on paper, never mind oral traditions of sharing. 
despite that, he live, lives in the city as a permanent resident. And the thing is, is that when you're a permanent resident, your residency can be taken away. And that is something that we are seeing in Jerusalem. So when Israel occupied Jerusalem in 1967, it is almost as if a demographic warfare started to take place. So Israel wanted to maintain a Jewish-Israeli majority in the city. But Palestinian uh, growth rate tends to be higher than the Jewish-Israeli growth rate. So how do you control the demographics? One way is through the wall, one way is through incentives for settlers to move into Jerusalem. Another way is to revoke that piece of identity, to change that piece of identity. So since 1967, over 14,000 Palestinians have had their IDs revoked from Jerusalem. And that might mean they're now living abroad. That might mean they've been cast out into the West Bank. And one of the ways you can get your uh, Jerusalem ID revoked is because you have to prove that your center of life is in Jerusalem. So Bethlehem and Jerusalem are actually really close together. It's like a 20 minute drive apart. Jerusalem housing prices are very expensive, uh, whereas Bethlehem is a little bit cheaper. So even I think about myself personally, in theory, I live in North York. I don't live in Toronto proper. And I live in North York because Toronto proper housing, I couldn't live there. I can't afford to live there, but I work there. I commute there. It's a 20 minute drive. Um, instead, I live in North York and do the commute. Someone from Jerusalem couldn't do that in Bethlehem because they have to prove that they're living in Jerusalem, working in the Jerusalem, and that their center of life is in Jerusalem. If they can't prove that, their residency gets revoked. Another example is my friend Rami. Rami went to the United States uh, to study engineering in university. He lived abroad for seven years um, while he was studying. He lost his Jerusalemite sta status. So now when he goes home to visit his mom, his sister, the house that he grew up in, he does not enter, he enters through Israeli passport control as a tourist and he gets a three month tourist visa to be allowed to be in that space. <clears throat> and as indigenous people are getting pushed into these isolated pieces of land, um, it's making way for industry and capitalism. And when we see about how industry and capitalism is playing out, we're seeing factories, pipelines, logging, uh, resource extraction. And these actions are often happening away from urban settler population due to some of the pollutants and the risk that uh, go alongside them. And they're, being, they're happening near indigenous communities. If you are currently uh, on Northern Turtle Island in Canada, on Netflix, there's this great documentary right now called There's Something in the Water that unpacks what environmental racism looks like in Nova Scotia. Highly recommend it. Um, but I just want to point out that the, the, the battle against pipelines being built on indigenous land um, is part of this pipelines are being built on in, near indigenous communities um, and they are experiencing the pollutants that come out of them. They are living the hazards. And one example of this is um, with Grassy Narrows First Nation. Now CPT has been in partnership with Grassy Narrows for over 20 years. From 1962 to 1970, the Dryden paper mill dumped 10 tons of mercury into the river system that feeds Grassy Narrows. As a result, 90% of the community of Grassy Narrows is experiencing symptoms of mercury poisoning. And a report just came out this week that due to mercury poisoning, members of Grassy Narrows are dying at a younger age. For decades, the national and the provincial governments denied that this mercury poisoning was taking place. Instead, they attributed the health problems the people of Grassy Narrows were experiencing was due to the personal and individual choices and decisions uh, that the members of Grassy Narrows were making. Complete victim blaming, blaming. And yet, while well, today they admit that yes, members of Grassy Narrows have mercury poisoning, for decades they denied it. For decades, the government said mercury poisoning will naturally go away. I'm grateful that today the governments have said that they're gonna work to clean up the river and I'm grateful uh, that they have vowed to um, 
and build a mercury treatment center. But this is just an example of that environmental racism. And we see this in Palestine too. So this is a creek area uh, near Bethlehem. Now, Israel controls 80% of the water aquifers in Bethlehem. So Bethlehem residents don't always have access to clean drinking water, but that's not the only challenge that they face. So this would be a creek that shepherds would rely on to feed their livestock, as well as farmers would rely on to, to water their crops. However, Israeli settlements have been dumping sewage and waste into the water areas that Palestinian farmers are relying on. This becomes a form of that environmental racism. This environmental destruction is not being experienced by the settler community, it's being, um, it's being experienced by the Palestinian community. And we see this in Tulkerem as well. Tulkerem is a Palestinian uh, village, uh, city uh, in the Northern West Bank. And this is an Israeli factory. This is a factory that was previously uh, well inside Israel and then they decided to move it to the seam zone. So right on the edge of the West Bank in Israel because uh, the factory owners wanted Palestinian cheap labor. But due to there's a series of factories here Due to these series of factories, Tulkadam has the highest cancer rates in the region. I met with a gas station attendant or a gas station manager who runs the gas station across the street from the factory. He only hires workers on a four month basis at the gas station because he does not want to be responsible for workers dying of cancer. When I met with various um, members of the community of Tulkerem, they also mentioned that on days that the wind blows the noxious smelling gas towards Israel, they actually shut down uh, the factories that day. I was not there to witness it, but those are the stories um, that I've been hearing. And then there's the military occupation, soldiers and the security, um, security in, in, in quotations, the security culture. So these are Israeli soldiers inside Ida refugee camp uh, in Bethlehem, near Bethlehem in Palestine. It is common to see soldiers uh, in Ida refugee camp, just like it's common to see soldiers in Hebron. Now I want to point out that you can see in the background of this picture, these are kids. These are kids walking to school because the picture, the building on the right hand side is actually a UN school. And they're walking to school and when they see these soldiers, they know these soldiers are not there for their protection. They have seen these soldiers enter their homes at night, taking members of their family. They have seen these soldiers spray tear gas into their community. They have seen these soldiers shoot rubber bullets and live ammunition at their community members and they themselves have been shot at. When they see these soldiers, they see a threat to their life. They do not see somebody that will protect them. And that constant threat is something indigenous folks in Turtle Island and Palestine experience. Because I think about my own upbringing and I spent some time growing up in Saskatchewan. And in Saskatchewan, uh, there was a time when Saskatoon police would pick up indigenous men in the winter drive them out of town in minus 30 weather, take their shoes and make them walk back to Saskatoon. These were called starlight tours. I've also heard of them happening in Quebec. And also when I lived in Winnipeg, an indigenous friend of mine uh, mentioned that he, when he was growing up, police would pick him up, drive him out of town. He said there was a time that he was picked up, driven out of town, they handcuffed him to a telephone pole they put telephone books on either side of his head and punched him. He passed out and when he woke up, they were laughing and cashing in the bets uh, because they were betting on how much time he would be passed out for. <coughs> and this threat continues just this month in a span of 10 days in Winnipeg, three indigenous people were killed by the police, including a child. 16-year-old Aisha Hudson, who was unarmed at the time, was shot and killed by the Winnipeg police. And so police and RCMP become a site of threat, not a site of protection. So for me growing up as a settler, I was taught that police were there to keep me safe. That is a settler, that is a settler message. Uh, for Indigenous folks or for Palestinian folks, uh, the opposite is true. 
and again, I am going to glaze over the imprisonment and criminalization section. Maybe that could also be part of the part two. Um, but Indigenous people in Canada are over incarcerated. There are 3,700 Indigenous people in Canadian prison. In Palestine, a quarter of Palestinian men will spend time in Israeli detention. My friend Samer from the West Bank, um, he is currently in prison for the third time. So I'm in communication with his wife and his kids, um, but he's in prison for the third time. Um, indigenous people face daily racial profiling uh, by the police, as well as Palestinians do as well. A friend of mine from Jerusalem, uh, he talks about how, who knows Hebrew, he talks about being pulled over by the police in Jerusalem. And when he rolled down his window, he gave a Hebrew greeting to the police officer. The police officer responded back to him, oh, I'm sorry, I thought you were Palestinian. Go ahead, I shouldn't have stopped you. And I also just wanna encourage you, this is a painting done by Kent Monkman. Um, and this is a painting um, of him expressing some of his frustration of the over-incarceration of indigenous people in Canada. Um, I really, Google it, Kent Monkman. Um, his artwork is very, very profound. He's an indigenous artist. Now what this does is, what the settler colonial system does is create a system where indigenous people are devalued within society and leaves room for a settler mob to enact violence. In Canada, there are thousands of murdered and missing indigenous women. Um, this is a picture. It's a highway that goes up to northern British Columbia, actually on the way up to Wet'suwet'en. Uh, this picture was taken by two CP Tears. It's called the Highway of Tears because over 40 women have gone, indigenous women have gone missing along the Highway of Tears. Uh, and this is a huge fear um, about around wet sewage in with the with the pipeline going there is that there's going to be a creation of these man camps, these worker camps. And we have experiences from Alberta that where these worker camps exist, violence against indigenous women increase. We have stories like Colton Bushy. Colton Bushy was from northern Saskatchewan. He was a young indigenous man that went out cruising uh, with his friends and he turned into a settler yard, uh, Gerald Stanley's yard. And I just want to point out that being raised in rural Saskatchewan, going cruising on a Friday, there isn't much to do out there. Uh, going cruising on a Friday night is something you do. I have done it countless times where I've gone cruising on a Friday night. You turn into a farmer's yard, you turn around, you leave. Um, so Gerald Stan or Colton Bushy uh, and his friends enter Gerald Stanley's property. Gerald Stanley claims that he is scared and he is under threat. He grabs a handgun and he ends up shooting Colton Bushy in the back of the head, execution style. Gerald Stanley goes to court and he is acquitted on all charges, including the mishandling of a firearm. I just wanna point out that when I went cruising uh, as a teenager and as a young adult, I never had a fear that a farmer was gonna come out and shoot me in the head. I think about Tina Fontaine. Tina Fontaine was a young indigenous woman whose body was found in the Red River in Winnipeg. Raymond Cormier, a settler, uh, there's recorded, recorded evidence, there's a recording of him insinuating that he is the one that killed Tina Fontaine, um, and yet he too was acquitted on all, all charges. And Palestinians experience this violence as well. Palestinian taxi drivers in Jerusalem share repeated stories of them being attacked for being Arab. I think about the Dawabshe family. The Dawabshe family had a, Settlers attacked the Dwabche family house, killing everybody except Ahmed, uh, the, the small child um, who suffered uh, severe burns as well. And this is just an article that was released last month for because the settler violence continues. And then I think about the killing of Muhammad Abu Khadr. Mama Abu Khadr was killed in 2014. Um, he was kidnapped by Israeli settlers in Jerusalem. Um, in the early hours of the morning, and he was taken out into a forest and his body was set on fire um, and killed. And so this whole structure creates this, this, this uh, space for this violence to be enacted on indigenous bodies. And the per perpetrators of this violence 
are not held accountable the same way in the same way. But while this structure and the system is happening, indigenous people are resisting against the structure. They are working for decolonization. And so I think about the community of Grassy Narrows who nearly every year take part in the river run uh, in Toronto, where thousands of people will join the members of Grassy Narrows in demanding that the governments clean up the river as well as build a medical treatment center. And this year, we finally got the announcement that the government is going to do both and listen to the members of Grassy Narrows. I think about what played out in January and February when the land defenders at Wet'suwet'en were invaded by the RCMP. Blockades went out across uh, Canada. Actions, to, uh, actions in solidarity happened across the world. Uh, and it was all Indigenous-led actions that were saying, no, this is not how you treat Indigenous people. Um, you have to respect um, the, the Wet'suwet'en title and their territory. And this is just a picture of all the actions that were taking place on February 25th across Turtle Island. Mass amounts of resistance that is Indigenous-led. I think about Palestine. Every single year, Palestinians gather to protest and to demand that they open Shahada Street. Now, Shahada Street is a old city street in the middle of Hebron uh, that used to be a prominent Palestinian market. There's Palestinian houses along that street. There's Palestinian businesses along that street. And yet, Israel has closed down that street, has forbidden Palestinians to walk on that street, to open their shops on that street, and every year facing tear gas, live ammunition, rubber-coated steel bullets, skunk trucks, Palestinians go out and they say, open the street. This is our right. I think about youth across Jerusalem, that when Israel goes in and tries to erase the Palestinian culture from Jerusalem, Palestinian youth take to the streets and they say, no, you will not erase us. You will not erase our voices from this place. And then I think about the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement, which, has in, which, has, which is Palestinian led and has inspired the world to stand in solidarity with Palestinian people as we work for peace and justice. There are also stories of settler solidarity. In Tel Aviv, every year there's a Human Rights Day parade. Uh, folks march for animal rights, LGBTQ rights, women rights, a whole bunch of other rights. But Palestinian rights and the right of return of refugees is completely ignored and erased from this parade. So this is an example of one year Zohrot, which is an Israeli organization. They said, no, we will not let Israel erase Palestinians from this. And so they created life-size images of Palestinian refugees who've been denied the right of return, and they marched them through the parade as a form of accountability. I think about all the actions that took place uh, across Turtle Island in solidarity with Wet'suwet'en when thousands of settlers came out on the streets of Toronto to stand in solidarity with Indigenous people. And CPT is there. And this is why I, I mean, I love working with this organization um, because we're there and we're standing in solidarity. And so within CPT, we have the Turtle Island Solidarity Network where we do indigenous solidarity. We do settler education. So like this workshop, uh, we do coalition building and we're working to undo settler colonialism. And what that can look like practically um, is in forms of accompaniment. Uh, this past February and, and March, we were able to send two groups of CPTers out to Wet'suwet'en uh, to be in solidarity with the uh, Wet'suwet'en people. And part of our job was to be there to document the CGL workers um, that were entering to keep full documentation about what was going on, to observe the police presence of what was going on. And as well as in Ontario, CPT was able to visit Tyndanaga and express our solidarity um, with the blockade that was there. And in Palestine, uh, CPT is in the old city of Hebron and we are taking our leadership from our partners there. But part of our work there is to walk Palestinian children to school, 
who face harassment from settlers who have to go through checkpoints. We observe and we monitor checkpoints, so how Israeli soldiers are treating Palestinians at checkpoints. We observe and we document when Palestinians get arrested, uh, and we also observe and document uh, nonviolent demonstrations uh, that happen. So what can you do? I know I've thrown a lot of information at you all at once, and I think I'm three minutes over my time. Uh, but we really do want to get you involved because decolonization is a collective communal process. Currently, um, our delegations are all put on hold, but when it is safe to travel again, I encourage all of you to go on a delegation to Grassy Narrows or to Palestine. Uh, invite CPT to do an undoing oppressions training in your community and learn more. Get involved in advocacy, boycott divestment and sanctions, uh, learn more about it, get involved in it, get involved in the United Nations Declaration on Rights of Indigenous People. Uh, and of course, I would love it if you folks could all get involved in CPT as well. Uh, so thank you. I think we're going to have time for questions now. Um, but I just want to again say thank you for this opportunity uh, to share uh, the learnings that I have received um, from standing in solidarity with Indigenous people, uh, both in Palestine uh, and here on Turtle Island. Thank you, Rochelle. Um, and thank you to those who've already uh, posted some of their questions in our Q&A box. Um, if you haven't done so already and have a question, please feel free to do that. Um, I'm going to read out our first question. Uh, and that is, how do you feel settler colonialism is reflected in politicians today? This is a great question. Um, I have a whole other slide series on that too, but I won't, I won't do that. Um, I think because the, both Israel and Canada, uh, they try and celebrate their states as being democracy. So Israel will say we're the only democracy in the Middle East. Um, Israel will try and point out um, how feminist it is, how friendly it is to the LGBTQ community. Canada likes to celebrate saying, you know, colonialism is something that happened before, we're sorry. And yet a lot of the rhetoric coming out of politicians still support settler colonialism. A year ago, I had a conversation with Senator uh, Don Plett. Uh, and Senator, when I, I was trying to convince him to support Bill C-262 and to no longer be a barrier. And I was talking to him, settler to settler, saying like, you know, we're a settler here on this land. This is how we can work at reconciliation. And he just outright said, I'm not a settler. This land is your land. This land is my land. I'm not a settler. Um, I think about Peter McKay, uh, who's running for the leadership in the Conservative Party of Canada, that called the land defenders at Wet Suwidin professional protesters and thugs. Um, now, thugs is often a comment that's used against racialized people. So I think it's an inherently racist term and often used to talk about irrational violence. And those were the, the, the terms that he used to talk about land defenders trying to stay on their land. And in Israel, there's the, uh, a former minister of justice, um, when talking about uh, fighters in Gaza, she not only called for the killing of Palestinian fighters in Gaza, she called for the killing of the mothers uh, of the fighters in Gaza, uh, because you have to cut off this, you have to cut off the head of the snake at, at, you have to cut off, you have to stop the snake at its head is how I think how she phrased it. Or I think about uh, Avigdor Lieberman, who has had multiple posts, um, ministry posts in the Israeli government, who, when, uh, who proposed a loyalty oath that Palestinians with Israeli citizenship would have to swear. And he said that if they don't swear that oath, he alluded to the fact that they needed to grab a sharp ax and cut off their head. Um, and so we see politicians feeding this rhetoric rather at working than on doing this violence that is taking place. Thank you, Rochelle. I'm just going to move on to the next question. Um, and it is, how can we settlers help to decolonize indigenous peoples? Ooh, this is a great question. Um, so 
and I, I was just asked this earlier today. For me as a settler, I realize I've been indoctrinated um, into this system. And so I also don't think I'm gonna have the quickest answers to know how to decolonize. And so I think this is where I look to our indigenous partners. Um, they know what needs to happen in order for decolonization uh, to occur. So that's where I can take a step back. I can listen and I can follow direction um, because they already know. So my job is to follow and to listen to what indigenous leaders um, and our indigenous partners are saying to us. Thank you. And I'm going to go to another question now. Um, how do you respond to Jewish Israelis who also claim to be indigenous to Palestine, historically dispossessed of their land? Right. Now, I've been confronted on this one. Um, I once met with a settler, Artie Gildman, in a frat settlement near Bethlehem. And he asked me this exact question. Um, if I'm on, I don't want to, I don't want to create a scapegoat for the answer. Um, CPT and also myself, I work very closely with independent Jewish voices. Um, so for me, what I'm trying to do is convince my own settler, my, my own community uh, to work on the side of justice as a settler. Um, so I'm not going to work to convince Jewish Israelis um, per se on like, on what they should be doing. Um, I think my friends at Independent Jewish Voices and Jewish Voices for Peace um, have a very clear handle on that. The thing is, is um, there, there are Jews that have been, like if you saw that first map, there are Jews that have been in Palestine um, for thousands and thousands of years. Um, and that is their ancestral land. And I don't wanna deny them that, but there is a difference um between there is a difference between that and the european settlers that are coming over that that are coming over right now um and as well as how do you live in neighbors with each other what is what does that entitlement look like as well so i don't think i've really answered your question um but i wouldn't within the israel palestine context i personally wouldn't if someone is saying that they are well they are indigenous um that's a longer conversation that needs to be had. That might not be the best strategy to have that conversation with me, given where I am in Canada. I can only share my personal narrative. Thanks, Michelle. Um, another question we have is, when did you first become aware of settler colonialism and what led you to resist? So I actually get emotional sometimes when I think about this. Um, I grew up in a very good intentioned um, Mennonite home um, that was very pro social justice. Um, and I'm very grateful for my parents and for my upbringing. I then went on to Canadian Mennonite University and that sort of whole Mennonite process continued. But I did have this idea that I could go out and help and I could go out and help in the world and that like I had this extra education that that, you know, I could do anything. And so I ended up going to Palestine. And the first thing I learned was, I don't know the culture. I don't know the language. Um, everything I've read and learned about Palestine is completely different than what I'm actually seeing. And wait a second, I can't help at all. I actually just have to slow down, be quiet and learn. And so I began this process there of learning. Um, and trying to be quiet and sitting in my discomfort. And that's not to say that prior to that, I didn't know that indigenous people weren't being treated well, but I would say I did not reckon, I did not admit my settler identity um, the same uh, until I got there. And that was really sparked because the organization I was working for hosted um, an indigenous delegation from Canada uh, from Turtle Island, actually, from all of Turtle Island. And I was able to accompany the delegation across Palestine. And I sat there and I listened to all of their stories. And this was coming at a time in my first time in Palestine where I was very angry at settlers and at Israelis and wondering how they could let this happen in their very own backyard. I mean, like, 
I'd go to, if I went to West Jerusalem, I would just be angry, like livid angry. Like, don't you know what's happening in the West Bank? Don't you know what's happening at these checkpoints? Don't you know what's happening here? And I became very self-righteous. And then I accompanied this indigenous delegation and I suddenly thought, oh my gosh, what do I know about what's happening in the land that I grew up in? What do I know about what's happening in Grassy Narrows? What do I know about what's happening on the streets of Winnipeg? Um, and I was like, I'm a settler. I'm a settler in all of this. Uh, and so that's sort of how I started to come to um, that learning process. Uh, and so I do have to give a huge shout out to, I'm not, I'm not sure if they're on this call because I haven't looked at the list, um, Harley Eagle and Erica Littlewolf, who have spent countless hours investing in me and helping me with my education with this. Thanks for that response, Rochelle. Uh, we've got time for one more question. Um, and what we've got one about what are the main things that we can be focusing on right now to undo settler colonialism? Is there certain movements or campaigns happening at the moment that we should be looking into? Yes. So one thing, especially during this time of COVID, um, the folks in Wet'suwet'en are still trying to resist the pipeline. Uh, the Turtle Island Facebook page is trying to post action items uh, that you can do. Uh, to try and stop that construction from happening. Mining has been considered an essential, essential work uh, during this pandemic. Um, so taking part in phoning MPs um, and trying to get that pipeline stopped. Uh, in Palestine, learning more about what's happening on the ground there, settler violence has increased um, during COVID-19 as well. Um, if you're at home, there are lots of documentaries out there um, that you can watch. You can, you can send me an email, Canada at cpt.org. I can give you a, a few recommendations of documentaries uh, and books that you can read. And also I just wanna give a shout out that next week, uh, May 5th, uh, we will be doing another webinar, uh, Stories from the Frontline of What's Sued In. And so I think during this time, it's, it's a great time, one, to be making phone calls uh, to MPs to demand change. Um, it's also a great time to take space and learn. I want to thank you folks all again. Um, this has been really, really great. Uh, I feel very honored to be able to share my learnings with you. Um, I do, I feel free to email me a few more of your questions. Um, I always say if there's something that I have upset you, with let's keep the dialogue going. Um, my email's on the internet, email me, let's keep the discussion going, let's learn together. Um, this is a, decolonization is a collective journey we need to take together. Uh, so let's keep the conversation going. I also, uh, my email is canada at cpt.org. You can also find it on our website. Um, you can also Google CPT Canada, probably will come up. I also just want to say that as we enter this time of COVID-19, everything feels very unpredictable. Um, we are expecting at CPT, we are going to uh, face some financial restrictions uh, coming up. Um, and it's my understanding, and I know I have a lot of friends that have been laid off and are experiencing um, a lot of financial restrictions themselves. Uh, I also know that some people uh, do have a bit more money. Uh, on hand right now. And we want to be, we know that because of COVID-19, author, authoritarian governments um, are using this as an opportunity for, to crack down. And so when CPT goes back to complete and full programming, we want our teams in a place that is even stronger uh, than they were than before. And so my one ask today is if you are, if you do have the capacity to donate, uh, please do. Um, if there were 150 people on this call and every single person donated just $20, that would be enough for two CPTers to be in Palestine for one month. So that's the direct impact your dollars could have when this COVID-19 is over. Uh, so please keep that in mind. Let's keep the conversation going. And thank you so much uh, for coming out tonight.